Just a blaring out with Eric Flair show tonight. Coming to you from Rasta Cowboy Records in beautiful downtown Tustin, California with Orange County punk rock legend Rick Agnew. Is it true that Casey Royer came up with the name Social Distortion? I think he did. I'm not sure. I can't really answer that for sure, but uh, I believe he did. It, it sounds like a Casey thing, you know? And so I think, I think he did, yeah. If Casey didn't become a rock star, he would have been such a great comedian and, and movie star because he's just got that personality. Oh, he still does. We were watching today the footage from that uh, garage rehab thing. Yeah, and didn't even see, they didn't even have the band playing on it and everything, but he was all through it because he is, you know, it's his buddy's garage and all this stuff. So he gets around, yeah, he's a clown, you know, he's my favorite clown. And he's, he's just always on fire, man. The guy's always just on, you know. <laughs> I mean, he's like fucking 60 and he's still like he was when he was like 19, you know. It's pretty amazing. Though it can get on the nerves sometimes, but I don't know. We have a way of relating. What was the level of ridicule and physical abuse for Rick Agnew and his punk rock compatriots in high school and on the street at that time? For a lot of them, they were getting the shit beat out of them. They were getting, you know, attacked and jumped and all that kind of stuff. Um, there was a couple times when I was sitting in a van getting stoned with like my friend Fred Tacone one time around the corner from where I lived. And uh, and all of a sudden, uh, it was that same group of guys, like same group of Hessians, you know, they were from that neighborhood stuff. And um, they saw us sitting in the van and they couldn't, and then they turned around and I was like, oh, here we go, like that. And they get out of the truck and they come up to the van and they, open up the door, open up, open up, like that. And I go, what do you want, man? Get out of here, get out of here, like that. I go, whatever open the door like this, you know, and, you know, kick it open. And then all of a sudden um, they come start trying to reach in and, and trying to throw punches, but they couldn't cut, get the right angles. And, uh, but was, I'd never forget, it's so funny because they would go like, mm, 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 and they get this weird sound like, what the fuck's wrong with you? And they're hitting, but it, you know, it, it didn't hurt or nothing. They couldn't get a good punch and everything. So. I just start kicking them, you know, in the body really hard and everything and stuff and t got the door shut and took off. That was about the worst I got, but I know a lot of people got pretty thrashing often, you know. It was like these guys had no, you know, I was wondering, it's like, why don't you guys just shave your heads or cut your hair? I mean, you're hanging out with us so much and you always want to know where parties are. You always say, just... Join the crowd, man, come on, you know, don't worry about it. I mean, what is it, you know, do you, you want to just hurt us or, you know, is it really because you may, maybe because you, like you want to fuck us or, you know, I mean, I don't know. And it was funny because uh, we knew their sisters. Three of the guy, Hessian guys, one, three of the main guys, their sisters were three of the black sweaters. Was that a gang? It was this girl, this little girl, a uh, group of uh, teenage girls, younger teenage girls that um, would come by my garage where my, I live with my parents and we would like be jamming there, me and my brothers or me and uh, this guy, Biddy, who I was in a band called Mertz is with and uh, we'd just be out there jamming and they'd, uh, they were from the neighborhood and stuff. So they'd walk by, you know, they were hanging out together and they'd walk by, look in the garage and just be like, wow, you know, hey, you guys, what are you, sorry, what are you doing? What's up, you know? Um, just, you know, whatever was said. And then, you know, yeah, you see, are you guys punk rock and everything and stuff and they giggle and everything. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, one of them showed up and she had her hair cut really short and bleached. Another one um, had her hair in these like braids or something. And, uh, and they were all wearing black sweaters. And we go, what's with the black sweaters? They go, we're the black sweaters, man. That's like, that's their, their colors or their gang. <laughs> And then had like, you know, a couple pins they got from, you know, Licorice Pizza over there on Euclid and Lincoln. And um, then after a while, they started hanging out more and more. And then they became part of the whole punk rock scene and stuff. That's why that one adolescence record that was put out of early demos and stuff, it's called uh, Naughty Women and Black Sweaters. Naughty Women because of the band and Black Sweaters because of the girls. Because they, there was like five of them and they'd hang out at all the parties. You know, the Black Hole, they'd hang out there a lot just get high with us and everything and stuff. And a lot of times, you know, the lights would be out and we'd just have a TV on and, 
you know, everybody would be like sharing DNA and stuff. And uh, <laughs> we didn't know about the whole thing back then. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was very, very interesting that that's why those guys were so adamant about it. They wouldn't let it go. And there was quite a few of them, those, uh, the guys that would follow them and stuff, like a couple of years later, I'd be at the Kukas Nest playing a show and, hey, Rick, what's up, man? Hey, hey, what do you think of the hair, man? The mohawk and everything. I'm looking, I'm going, wait, you were one of those fuckers, <laughs> you know? But I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't, you know, I could have them jumped, you know, at that point or whatever, beat up into everything. But I just like, welcome to the gang, welcome to the club. I mean, the more the merrier, hell, if he, if he you know, that person's sitting there and they're, they turned over to punk. Hey, great. I'm good with it, you know? I'm not gonna sit there and go, Whoa. Tell me some highlights of your time hanging out at the, at the Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> Which time? All the times? <laughs> it was like a, almost like second home. I mean, once again, it was just complete anarchy. Go in the, pack, in the parking lot and stuff, you know, and just be drinking beers and everything. And then the Black Beauty man would come by and stuff on his bicycle, and he would just make a killing selling like Black Beauties, you know, which was a caffeinated mm -hmm. pills and stuff. We'd always like crush them open and <laughs> like that, you know, and then down beer and everything and stuff. And when we when we were playing shows and everything, we would get so high on those Black Beauties and drink so much that like every other few songs, you'd have to like run in back of the amplifier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get, you get really sick, you know, but it, then you just get over it. I don't know, it just, it just seemed like normalcy at the time. It just seemed like the everyday thing, but the more you look back on it, the more you see how things have changed and everything. It was like, wow, that was pretty wild times, man, but it was normal for us. And the Jerry Roach was, you know, he still is an incredible man. I mean, for the most part, he loved us and everything. You know, he'd always let us in free and stuff. And a couple times, like, where after a show, we'd be sitting there talking and everything. And uh, we were going, one time we were going to go to the mountains right after the show and everything. So he kicked us down with, like, three cases of beer, you know. So it was cool. And uh, there was another time when I was in Christian Death and we were going to play there and... Uh, I forgot what happened, but we got in a big old argument, and he grabs me, and he throws me against the wall, and starts spitting in my face. Like, what are you gonna do about it? Oh, what are you gonna do about it? And what did I do? I, I just start crying because my feelings were hurt, you know. And uh, you know, after that, it was just kind of, you know, sh for a bit. But then he got that club called uh, uh, Radio City. Radio City. Thank you. Slayer played there, Metallica. I roadied for some bands too back in the day. I saw the one show. It was Dark Angel, uh, Possessed, and Slayer. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. I never forget it because it was so hot in there. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. Well, he kept it hot. You know why? He wanted to sell beer. Yeah, exactly. That's a, I know exactly. because because the managers of some of the bands that I roadied for would always go. He's doing it. He's keeping it hot in here so people will buy beer. And it was suffocating in there. It was, man. I mean, you felt like you were going to faint after a while, you know. And going back to the Cuckoo's Nest, I mean, Iggy played there and the Ramones played there. Did you go to either of those shows? No, I went to neither of those shows, but I did go to see uh, David Johansson when he played there um doing his solo thing and stuff. And then I got to meet him and hang out with him for a while. He's really it's a total sweetheart nicest guy um i saw the cramps there a couple times uh blasters open for them mm -hmm. and this little moments i remember is like when the cramps were fading and some guy comes up and he flicks a cigarette at them and it hits it hits uh, ivy right in the head like you know and it just all these like embers and ashes going down her face and everything and stuff she didn't even fucking flinch and i was like I love that, you know, when that happens, you know, with a musician, like, they'll just like, huh, duck feathers, you know, and I, I just had the biggest admiration for her after that. I thought it was so cool. And then you look at the person, just go, you asshole, <laughs> you know? I was the only one that almost got in a fight with Jerry. There was um, when Walla Voodoo, was, it was Walla Voodoo, Adolescence, and an opening band. And uh, their drummer at the time, that Joe Nanini guy, yeah, I never liked him. A lot of people didn't like him. He was a real asshole, you know? And I'm not just saying that because he's dead now, but I would say it to his face. He got a big old fight with uh, 
Jerry Roach. They were both in the parking lot, just, you know, just, you know how like when the fight breaks out like that and, and it seems like they're going, <laughs> everything, throwing blows and stuff. And after that, I knew it was right about Joe. <laughs> so you can't take him anywhere, man. Roach, knock him out? No, they just, they got, they got split up and everything. So what happened was they just, uh, they, they took off. You know, the fall of voodoo, they just, you know, the rest of them just kind of go, well, we got to get out of here, you know. We're not going to let this happen, da-da-da-da. So, which I was kind of thankful for because then we were the headline event and we got their money. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Did you ever have any encounters with the Go-Go's? <laughs> <laughs> yes. They used to hang out at the mask when we'd go back, you know, in the mask days and stuff. And they would, uh, they were just, basically, they were just like kind of like, not necessarily sexual groupies, but just groupies, you know, hanging out with the bands and everything and stuff. Some of them went out with some of the weirdos and stuff like that. But they were basically just punk girls, you know, that were, went to Hollywood High or whatever school it was they went to. But then uh, all of a sudden, like, as things were, you know, germinating at, at the mask and everything. And they were starting to talk about like, yeah, we're gonna start our own band called the Go-Go's. And, like that. and we were all like going, oh man. And they were, they were kind of like the joke, you know what I mean? Like that you, what we would do is like, we'd go out and hang out at the mask for days at a time. We stayed with this band called the Controllers. They were one of the first bands we met down there and, and everything. And they went on, a couple of them went on to, do, to be the Gears. And, uh, but the Controllers, they had a studio there they lived in. There, there was like studios and you'd live there too. The thing to do was like to get really drunk and then go over and listen to the Go-Go's practice in the big room and just, and, and laugh at them. <laughs> but not really like, ah, you suck and anything like that. Just, you know, just, just kind of, how cute, you know? And they, oh, they could like, they could really hardly play at all, you know? But it was cute, you know? I mean, they were trying. You had to give them that, and they were and they were nice too. Especially Belinda, she was a sweetheart. She was a total sweetheart. And Margo, I loved Margo. When they kicked her out, I got bummed. And then I didn't like them anymore because <laughs> Margo was really, really sweetheart. Jane was cool, but she's you know she was a Hollywood girl. You know, some of them they were just like Hollywood girls. What does that mean? They were just like Hollywood girls. They already had the attitude built in, you know, because. You know, you know what I mean? I don't know how to explain it, but it's just kind of like where, well, first of all, the, most people there just did not accept Orange County people for quite a while. They thought we were hicks and, you know, go back to your redneck Orange County. And they didn't want us, you know, filtering into their, into their scene and stuff. But we kept going and we kept taking the abuse, me and Robert Omelette and, uh, and Beatrice and Bill, you know, for Naughty Women. Scott, Hoogland, Hoogland, whatever you want to say. Um, we'd go down there all the time and we, you know, they would pull that attitude towards us, you know, snub us and everything, like whatever, you know. And um, I mean, we, controllers loved us. We loved the controllers. Um, Darby, we used to go to his apartment all the time that he had like right there kind of by the whiskey. And um, we, we know him from like, uh, uh, he used to build met him at like Bowie shows and Queen shows and stuff like that. So he was always good, cool, you know. He never pulled that. He was just always Darby, you know. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, what was his personality like? Like you see, like when they interview him or whatever and stuff, he was just kind of like you know, just Darby. He was kind of like, like to get drunk a lot, like to get high and everything and stuff, and was just kind of out there, you know. A lot of these people that were early punks and stuff, they. They were unique. They were individuals that had their own agendas going, you know. And Darby uh, was also part of this school thing that happened in Fairfax, and it was like a alternative school kind of thing. And uh, Paul Rosler, who I play in a band with now, who was at the Screamers, he was part of it. His sister Kira was part of it. If Paul was here, he could tell you each and every one of them. But you, you've seen pictures before of that of that group of people, yeah. I think that was just as important and responsible for the whole punk rock, you know, and musical scene in Hollywood as being in Hollywood. Because you will notice that, like, especially when you tour, every city has its own, like, kind of basis of how the general punks are 
like of course in Hollywood there you're gonna be glamoury glitzy type of bands and you know going for that big prize you go to Arizona Texas and stuff like that meat puppets and bands like that where they they turn to lean back towards being in like country tinge you know you become like whatever your culture is you know and incorporate it it seems something like that there are lots of photos of Darby at parties with Joan Jett, the Runaways. I mean, were you at those parties? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That we'd see the screamers there and stuff a lot, you know. And and Joan, you know, with her girlfriend of the time or whatever, you know, it's, uh, that was funny too because it was usually like a super hot-looking, real normal-looking beach girl, blonde beach girl, that was her girlfriend. And it'd be funny because we, you know, in fact, it was kind of cruel. We'd bring like, you know new people from Orange County to these parties and stuff. And some of them are like these dudes that were just like, you know, they were such like dogs, you know, <laughs> like that. And they'd, you know, they'd, they'd see like Joan's girlfriend. It's like, oh, she's hot, man. Dude, what's she doing here? And I go, I don't know. Why don't you go up and talk her up, find out. <laughs> and we sit back and go, you know, <laughs> see how long, do a betting pull, see how long it takes Joan to go over there and smack the guy across the head. And, wow. you know, I mean, she, she was very jealous like that. You know, she, she didn't want anybody messing with her property and her territory. Other than that, Joan was always a very, very, very nice gal. She was really cool. She's, um, and Darby is cool. But, I mean, they they were all really cool. That but the parties were fun you know and it just like any other parties basically kim fowley just when the mechanics played with the runaways at the whiskey um he came up and looked in the room and started talking and start uh start totally like uh talking up uh, uh tim rocka's girlfriend at the time who he was very very possessive of and stuff but but kim fowley was a hero kim fowley was this hollywood you know to people from Orange County and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I know people in L.A. who basically never liked the guy. He always said he was a scumbag and he's just a piece of shit, you know, and always will be. But we were like, wow, that's Kim Valley, you know, so. And he was he was making up these lyrics at, like on the spot about uh, Tim's girlfriend and then sitting next to her and being like and seeing these pretty, I mean, we're just like, oh, dude, you know. After that, I didn't like, he, he always reminded me of a monster anyway. He was kind of a very iconic looking dude, you know. Is it true that Steve Soto approached you first to join the adolescents, and then you suggested that your 15 year old brother Frank play guitar for the adolescents instead? At the time I was in the detours, so I have no recall of how that formed. All I know is that uh, when Steve got kicked out of Agent Orange, him and Frank were hanging out a lot, so I guess they decided to start the the, the band. And uh, when Agent Orange played at the Hong Kong Cafe, this like little super skinny blonde kid with big blue eyes, about oh, sorry, about like this, you know. And he was the first person I ever saw actually dive off a stage, even though the stage was like yay high, you know, about a foot and a half. Uh, he was going out there and jumping into the people, and it was like nobody done that ever. I mean, it was like except Iggy. So we're like, oh, that, and look at him. He look at him. He just has a look because he was barefoot. He's I guess Rick Elric was kind of a hero of his, uh, and he had just old torn up jeans and a t-shirt. Looked like he hadn't bathed in about a month or changed his clothes. And we were just checking him out, go, God, we gotta meet this guy, you know what I mean? And Steve would just be getting drunk in the car and go, and then we're talking about starting, you know, a band and stuff. Uh, but uh, I guess he started out with Frank. I don't know, everything was so just like, boom, 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 you know, time wise, so I couldn't really say, but I remember sitting in the car and going, dude, I just pictured, you know, that, that kid, you know, just singing with a band and, having like no shirt, just jeans like Iggy Pop or something and just bleeding from his head and, and just holding on to the microphone and just looking like, you know, like that. That was always a picture in our heads and stuff. So, but it was basically Frank, Steve and Tony that started it. Then they got John O'Donovan, who was a, you know, local Fullerton kid and Peter Pan. I forgot, <laughs> I forgot his real name now, Greg, I think it was Greg. And he was just a kid that played some drums that Frank knew from Fullerton High School. So, and that's how that band 
that was the first incantation of that band. Did you feel super confident as a guitar player when you joined the adolescents? I never felt confident confident about playing or being in a band. I still don't think I, I don't think I'm that good of a guitar player at all. Never have thought I was. I never I never will. I don't know. Um, confidence wise, it was called beer, <laughs> alcohol. I just get so rip roaring drunk. I wouldn't give a fuck. You know, I would just go up there and play but it always seemed to be kind of a second nature thing you know I've been known to go up and be like not even remember a show you know or be woken up and have a guitar put on me this happened on tour quite a few times when I was getting all fucked up and and just be like hanging there like this and everything and then start playing I don't know it's almost like a switch it's like I, I'm like an autopilot you know I won't remember playing I'll be out of my mind drunk and high or whatever and stuff and people you know dude man you shredded man you played great I'm like thinking what I don't even remember and then you know later on when you'd see videos of yourself and everything and hear record live recordings it was like you know <clears throat> I was like hey did I do that <laughs> you know but um so there was never really a confidence there's never really been a confidence probably the last few years to be honest with you the last few years ever since i got sober and cleaned up and everything i just got to a point like before i couldn't even perform without being drunk forget it you know it's like i can't go on i need beers you know and um once i got straight or you know clean sober uh it was if it's i don't know i just finally said you know what's i've been doing this so long screw it i don't give you know what what i did was i didn't give a fuck about funk about fucking up i didn't give i didn't give a damn what happened up there you know by doing so it was like got rid the confidence came in if that makes sense it's kind of a I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of a complex person. <laughs> I, I find it very, very hard to explain my rhymes or rationalizations or reasons for anything. Do you remember the first time you played sober? <laughs> no, <laughs> I can't, no, I had too many shows, too many things. Did you think you had arrived as a star when Posh Boy's Robbie Fields presented the adolescents with gold singles as a result of the song Amoeba off the 1980 Rodney on the Rock compilation becoming a hit at the Starwood in LA, you were presented with gold singles. Well, first of all, and I knew this from the get-go, is they were, just, um, they were just like cheap trophies. I mean, they weren't actual gold records. There was no RIAA certification on it or anything. It was just like, you know, it was just kind of his way of saying thank you and, and, and celebrating the fact that we had a, an actual like a song. It was the first punk rock song actually on K-Rock to have maximum rotation. It, it, went, it, it went from the Rodney on the Rock show to like being regular rotation, you know, and so he was really happy about that. A lot of people were happy about that. So at this one show that we did, the Starwood one, it was like, uh, it was our first headlining show, I think, too. Um, he wanted to come out and uh, present us with those and everything. And I thought that like, he told me about it before. And I go, well, that's cute. That's great. You know, how? Oh, wow. You know, wow. And um, I think my parents were there. So they went to a lot of the shows like that. <clears throat> and so Tony, being the ever present, like, I don't care whose toes I step on. I'm gonna be Mr. Punk Rock, you know, which eventually is what broke up the band or what got me to just say, fuck you, I'm out of here. Cause you know, I mean, here we were on our way up and you know, mind you, yeah, I was a punker and everything, but I, I mean, but I wanted to be a beetle first. <laughs> I wanted to be a monkey first. Mm -hmm. I wanted, you know, I want to go all the way with it. Mm -hmm. Why not? There's nothing in punk rock that ever said, if you make it, you know, you're not punk rock anymore and who cares, you know what I mean? It's like, that, that was never a stipulation or rule, but for some reason, somewhere got lost in the translation that, uh, oh, they used to call it selling out. Selling out would be doing what you people say, not making money or becoming big. That, that never entered the equation in my mind, you know? But Tony just wanted to slaughter the whole thing. I don't know, maybe he was fear of uh, fame, fear of that, I don't know. 
But um, what happened was when Poshboy came down and um, brought the gold records, um, he had mine first and he held it and went to say something, you know, about, you know, uh, this is to commemorate blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden Tony just grabs the microphone and grabs my fucking thing. He had four of them, you know, one for each one. And then Tony just flings it out in the audience. I'm like, motherfucker. What the fuck, man? Throw your own, you know? Because I saw that my name was on him. I'm like, cool, you know? And um, it survived it. But then later on, it got smashed by somebody else I won't bring up. And he did that and everything. And then had Robbie Fields, like, kicked off the stage or whatever, or pushed off the stage, people throwing stuff at him, booing him, because of Tony's, you know, little diet, you know, tirade and stuff. And then he had, a, that same night, he had a uh, effigy of, of Hosh Boy made and stuff and then had it hanging up and everything and threw that out in the audience and you know that was the beginning of the end as far as i was concerned you know i mean we had it all in our hands you know we had the whole thing we could have been the the we could have been the social distortion or the even bigger you know the social distortion offspring whatever you know it could have been the biggest punk band here as far as like in making some Oh, dude, <laughs> it always helps, you know. How much longer after that event took place did you did you call it quits? Did you exit the adolescence? They actually kicked me out, and my last show ever with them was at the Starwood on my birthday. It was a couple of weeks after that. We were, we were having a meeting. Mike Patton took over being our uh, manager. Eddie Subtitle was at first, but then Mike Patton took it over, and he was at the house. We we're supposed to meet about doing a, a U.S. tour. I was super excited about that, you know, and everything. And that's what the meeting was supposed to be for. I was there, you know, punctual, as I, I like to be punctual. And uh, waiting, waiting, waiting for the guys to show up. They finally show up. And then um, all of a sudden, it's like, okay, what? something's wrong here. Because they all come in and everything and stuff, and they wouldn't say hi. They were, you know, all four of the other guys that just kind of sat down and, like, comes in and he goes okay i go okay so we'll, uh, let's let's talk about this tour and everything uh michael's oh okay hold on first of all um we're not going to be doing a tour most likely and this meeting is uh well go ahead you guys and then you know tony just immediately goes you know rick i mean you're always this and that this and that and i'd rather have you as a friend than a band member and everything and stuff so we talked about it we decided that it's a good idea for you not to be in the band anymore and then um i said what and then steve started going on you know once steve has like a little somebody started then he he got really upset. You could tell he was upset about it. He didn't like doing it, but that he had no real choice. Kind of like how it was all the way until the day he died, you know. It's kind of always, you know, under Tony's thumb. What Tony wanted, Tony got, you know. And uh, it's been like that since day one. It's still like that. He, uh, so he was like, yeah, Rick, because, you know, when you do this and that, blah, 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 na, 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 na. And I'm like, oh, okay. And, you know, here I thought we were going to be going on a tour, and I'm getting kicked out of the van. And I look over at Frank. Frank's got his book. Uh, he's just got his face in a, in a comic book, reading it like that. I go, Frank, do you, what do you got to say anything about this? And one couldn't even look at me, couldn't even face me. And, and things don't change. They just don't change because everybody <laughs> involved, they do the same thing with their stuff. Sorry, guys, but it's the truth. Um, and then Casey, yeah, I'm all, Casey, Casey, come on, man, dude. You know, we're, remember, we're bros. We go in every band together. What's going on here? And he's all like, oh, well, 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 yeah. And then I, <laughs> I reach over and I grab his comic book and I turn it over. It was classic, like, you know, the classic <laughs> move where, you know, somebody's trying to act like they're reading or something and it's upside down. And when I told that, I just, I couldn't help it. I started laughing. <laughs> And thinking like, you know, always count on Casey for a laugh, man, for some levity. And um, so I just said, well, fuck you guys then. I don't need this shit, you know. If that's the way you feel, that's the way you feel. See ya. And just left. And um, then we got back together in that lineup later. Then they, they recorded uh, that Welcome to Reality EP, 
which was basically songs that Casey and Steve Roberts worked on. It was from a earlier, earlier incantation called D.I. And that was a side band because we never rehearsed with the adolescents because we were doing so many shows. And we all loved Flipper, so we decided we're going to start a Flipper band. And we call it D.I. Drug Ideology because we'd all get together at Brea Beach at, at, at Casey and Steve's apartment. And I was the drummer, Casey was the bass player and singer, Steve Roberts was the guitar player who later on was in adolescence. And then a singer was this taxi driver guy that was in the punk that lived there named Daryl Monroe. And uh, we would just do all like flipper dirge type of stuff, you know. We didn't play any flipper covers, but we were doing that kind of thing because we loved it, you know. It was, just, it was fun. And drug ideology, everybody that day would go out and get as many different kinds of drugs and alcohol as they could, bring it all to the table, and then we divide it and just adjust it all before a show <laughs> or a party. <laughs> there was one in Montebello where we played, and there, there was a bunch of shrooms that, that night. And um, my drums, the drum heads, grew faces that were talking to me, and they were helping me to drum. You know what I mean? It was it was just like weird. Yeah, it was really bizarre. You and Casey, man, you guys make me laugh. The blaring out show. 